that I thought, I've just got to take some time off and think about why I was so unbelievably wrong. So I went pheasant hunting, not that it was the pheasant's fault, but that is kind of a way to clear your head. And I, um, and I wound up, because bird hunting really is, again, not good for the birds, but very good for you. And I wound up uh, in South Dakota with Kevin, among other people, including a couple of my college roommates. And I was just, I was so impressed by him as a person and really, the, having spent my life in Washington, I can tell you, if you're not from here, the, the key question about anybody who runs any institution in Washington is, how false is this person? <laughs> God sends messages. We can't immediately translate all of them. Uh, so I, I can't tell you what that meant. There clearly is meaning. The point is, uh, the man who runs Heritage is not false at all. In fact, my assessment of him was, he's completely real. He's, a complete, he's an honest person. He means it. He's not playing a role. And that was so thrilling to me to see that. And by the way, it was confirmed by one of Heritage's security people who was standing backstage with me, and I asked him, because the security guys always know they're all former cops. You know, they've seen everything. They have seen humanity in various states of drunken undress. Like, you can't shock them. And they know who's real and who's not. And I asked, you know, what do you, what do you think? And... One of them said to me, to my face, I would go to war for him. And I thought, and, and these are the kind of people who will tell you the truth. I mean, like, why would he lie to me? I don't even know his name, but he meant it. Um, and so to see a leader, a real leader at the helm of an institution that matters, that has the kind of throw weight that Heritage does, was thrilling, was absolutely thrilling for me because the story of the last decade is the collapse of leadership, not of the population. The people remain noble and decent, so far as I can tell. I still live here, I'm never leaving. We have good people, we have terrible people in charge. And not just of our government, but of the institutions that I grew up in, the Episcopal Church, my high school. You know, I could just go on and on and on. They're all run by weak people. And, you know, it's the same in marriage. You know, weak husband causes angry wife. Weak leaders cause an angry country. That's true. And to see someone who's not a weak leader at the helm of heritage just thrilled me. Um, so I wanted to come for that reason, just being totally blunt with you. And the second reason is to pay homage and to give some measure of thanks to Ed Fulmer for giving me my first job, which changed my life. And I was... To say I was not a promising hire would be an understatement. It's not false modesty. In fact, if anything, I'm underplaying it. Um, but I was leaving college without a degree or a job and attempting to marry my girlfriend, which I subsequently did, and ran into this giant roadblock in the form of her Episcopal priest father who said, no, you know, job first. Um, and not only did I not have a job, I had like no idea what I wanted to do. And so I applied to a couple of different places, the CIA, if you can even imagine, um, some boarding school in Rabat, because I thought, you know, Morocco, lower standards, maybe they'll hire me, no. And I, w I wound up um, at Heritage, as you heard, uh, as a fact checker, copy editor um, at Policy Review, the quarterly magazine of the Heritage Foundation. And it, that job absolutely changed my life. I was paid $14,000 a year plus a $100 bill for Christmas, which Dr. Fulner gave out personally to the entire staff, at least half of whom went downstairs and bought liquor with it at the liquor store, <laughs> which I think is now part of the intern housing. Um, but it was a long time ago. It was so long ago I smoked in my office. That's how long ago it was. That's like, that's like riding a mule to work, just to put it in the context of American history. Smoke in your office? Yeah, it did. Um, in fact, Matt Spaulding told me to stop one day, and I thought, wow. Uh, this modernization program is moving too fast for me. I, I can't deal with it. I've always been conservative in the truest sense. But Matt, you were right, and I quit. And uh, anyway, um, but yes, it was a long, a long, long time ago. And in the course of that job, though I didn't get rich, to be honest with you, um, I did learn what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, which was become a journalist. And that was really under the guidance of a man called Adam Meyerson, who ran it, who was. On, uh, that was 32 years ago, and to this day, he really is the kindest person I've ever worked for. Uh, just kind and patient and exactly, he thought I was completely nuts, he thought I was a lunatic, and, um, and I could tell he thought that, uh, but he was patient with me 
through my entire year and a half there, helped me get my next job at a newspaper in Arkansas um, because no one else would hire me, but he set me up with this job. He walked into my cubicle and said, do you want to move to Arkansas? And so I called my bride, who was a religion teacher at the local Episcopal school, and I said, do you want to move to Arkansas? And what a wonderful woman she's turned out to be. And she said, of course. Is that near Colorado? Quote, quote. <laughs> Very much. She was willing to go there. Um, very much a Northeasterner at heart, but, uh, and we did and we loved it, but I got there because Adam Meyerson felt that it was his job to help me get my next job because his job was to train up reasonable people and put them in journalism, even if it meant sending them to Arkansas. Um, and, and I was thinking about Heritage this morning in the shower, not a place I think about it, but I did today, and what makes it great, and one of the best things about Heritage over time, longitudinally, 50 years, say, is that Heritage has always hired a lot of people. And that is an underrated thing. It really is. Giving people a job, even if it's 14 grand a year plus a $100 bill for liquor, you, you change someone's life. You put them on a, on a trajectory. At least that's true for me. I mean, I had not succeeded in school, to put it mildly. And I did not feel, I always, I always felt like I was smart. Not one other person felt that way until I got to Heritage. <laughs> I'm not sure they were super impressed, but they treated me like an adult because they had, high, they had high intellectual standards. They were standards of honesty. And, you know, the idea at Heritage when I worked there wasn't just that, you know, we're fighting this war against the other side, of course, but it did not logically follow from that at Heritage that you could say whatever you wanted. Just because the other side was rotten didn't mean you could be rotten. They really hewed to the highest standards of factual accuracy, intellectual honesty. They really meant it. They did. And even if you didn't agree with them, they were very serious about it. They were intellectually serious people, every single person I worked with. The receptionist in the office at Policy Review was going to school at night to learn Russian. And then the week I started at Policy Review, the Soviet Union collapsed, which was an amazing thing. The coup against Gorbachev in the third week of August, 1991, was the week I started at Heritage. And in retrospect, of course, you never appreciate the significance of things as they happen to you. You can't really know what the movie's about until it ends. But at the time, we didn't really appreciate how, well, two things. One, our entire political orientation was based on this war between the United States and the Soviet Union, this Cold War, but very much a war. And every part of our politics, as you well remember, those of you my age and older remember, every part of our politics revolved around that central conflict.